Is it too early to assess the impact of MIFID 2 on markets? I think it probably is. I, you know, this is something that uh, particularly uh, uh, people operating in Europe, our, col our colleagues at our European cousins, AFME, have been working on uh, for the last couple of years to get ready for. It's a massive piece of legislation affecting the European markets, and so I think we need to see how it goes through, not just over the next, uh, not just over the next few days, but the next few months, and certainly over the next year. And I, I know you had St Stephen Major on recently uh, this morning talking about the fact that the, the European authorities are going to have to look back. What I would say from a U.S. perspective as well, because of the extraterritorial nature of many parts of MIFID, it's, we're very thankful that uh, the SEC, led by Chairman Clayton, took steps to make sure that uh, cross-border uh, execution would not be in conflict with U.S. law when it comes to things like uh, ATSs or, or, or the unbundling of research. And so I think from a U.S. perspective so far, we've been able to handle the impact of this. Yeah, and what sort of issues are your members uh, bringing up? I know you're working closely with your members on the implementation of MIFID II in 2018. What are the biggest hurdles you have to address? Well, I think, I think the, first, the first two big things that we were looking at, again, from a U.S. perspective, was w with the requirement of unbundling and, and of research cost uh, where we didn't want to be in conflict with how U.S. law treats that. Uh, the SEC gave us relief. It's limited relief, temporarily relief for 30 months. So it's something we're going to have to watch going forward. But that allows uh, uh, research to continue to be provided to clients, which we think is very important. And frankly, the Europeans, I think, is very important. The second is uh, the granting of equivalents uh, for uh, uh, U.S. ATS, for, for, for the share trading obligation. And again, the SEC, working with the European Commission, was able to accomplish that for about 30 ATSs in the U.S. So, so far, we have not heard of any problems in, in where you've had dual uh, listing of, of shares in the U.S. and, and uh, in Europe, where that's created a liquidity problem, at least from the U.S. perspective. Uh, on the legal entity identifier, again, um, where, you know, you can't trade without having an LEI, uh, I think that's less of a problem for the U.S. as it is maybe for other jurisdictions. But those are things that we're watching very closely. And then lastly, as we move towards Brexit, uh, I think we're going to want to watch very closely closely uh, how Europe decides to move forward with their you know, third party equivalents uh, uh, on a going forward basis. Yeah, what else have you been hearing from your members, Ken? I mean, you know, obviously members of SIFMA include everybody from money managers to banks to brokerages. Some are winners and some are losers in this, in this new era, right? Well, conceivably, and, and probably more so in Europe than, 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 in, than in, in the U.S., although many of our members are, op, are big operators in, in both jurisdictions. So I think we're going to have to see how this plays out. And I think as we were leading up to the uh, go-live date for uh, MIFID II in discussions that I've been in with, uh, with uh, folks at the European Commission as well as with our members, I think the European uh, Commission was looking and saying, you know, we're going to have to step back uh, and, and come back and take a look at this. And in fact, they've already talked about in 2019 looking and seeing what the impact is, because this is such, you know, this is such a massive piece of legislation. And, and while the European markets are far different than the U.S. markets, much smaller than the U.S. markets, uh, there is there is a concern that all of this could have negative consequences on an ongoing basis with respect to liquidity and providers. So not so much winners and losers uh, as much as in the terms of, 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 the, of the execution of services for clients. And if I could just ask Ask you, you know, a more domestic-oriented question for a minute. President Trump talking about, uh, you know, rolling back some regulations. How has that been impacting the financial industry in general as we, you know, close out 2017 and into 2018? What are the main concerns at this point? Well, I think what, what the, the Trump administration has done through the work that the Treasury Department has done in preparing these reports of looking at financial rules and regulations has been quite deliberate and quite middle, down the middle of the road. Uh, there are a lot of things that they've talked about of looking back at the various rules that were put in place since the financial crisis that need to be recalibrated. So I don't see it as much as a rollback as a recalibration. And in some cases, this is similar to what uh, uh, their colleagues in Europe and Asia have talked about as well. Uh, it's a gradual process. I think it's something we'll see as the new regulators take their seats, that they'll be looking to say, are the rules that were adopted accomplishing the goals that we wanted to accomplish at the time in terms of financial stability? And what is their impact on economic growth as well? And do we need to adjust the dials as such to put them in, uh, uh, to make them work better and not forestall uh, economic growth potential?